Good afternoon, and welcome back to Philadelphia Magazine's ThinkFest. I'm Tom McGrath, editor of Philadelphia. We've been hosting these conversations about the future of Philadelphia all week long with some of our city's most influential thought leaders. If you've missed any of the conversations and would like to see them, I invite you to go to phillymag.com thinkfest and check out the videos there. I also invite you to join us for our remaining conversations this week, including our interview later on this afternoon at 4 o'clock with Philadelphia Mayor Jim Kenney. Today's conversation is about the future of higher education, with Drexel University President John Fry being interviewed by Philly Mag staff writer David Morrell. Thanks to our sponsors for this event, including ThinkFest's presenting sponsor, Bank of America, as well as St. Joseph's University, T-Zero Group, and Paperboy Media Group. And now, here's our conversation about higher education. Thank you for tuning in. Greetings, virtual audience. Um, I'm David Morrell. Uh, welcome to a virtual edition of ThinkFest. Um, I'm imagining a roaring round of applause right now. Um, I have with me here today John Fry who is the president of Drexel University. Um, you probably know who he is already, but in case you flunked the John Fry 101 course, I'll just give you a quick um, little rundown. So as I mentioned, he is president of Drexel University, a uh, position he's held there since 2010. Uh, before that, John was president of Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster. And prior to that, he was an executive vice president at Penn. Uh, where he was one of the main architects in what was called sort of the West Philadelphia Initiative, a uh, big investment and in building plan um, to sort of revitalize um, that surrounding neighborhood. Uh, and that also sort of involved the creation of the Penn Alexander School in, in West Philly. Uh, now he's sort of in the midst of a similar big project um, in the surrounding neighborhood of uh, Powelton and Mantua for Drexel. That's the Last time I checked, it was $3.5 billion development effort called Schuylkill Yards um, and sort of a similar type of big building program for office space, um, classroom space, and retail residential. Um, and of course, today we're going to be talking about the future of higher education, um, sort of with respect to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, but also we'll be talking about some other topics too, um, a little bit about um, sort of social justice uh, issues as well, sort of uh, with respect to the kind of, um, you know, protests going on in the country right now. Um, so we'll have about a half hour of Q&A and then for the last 15 minutes or so, um, maybe do some audience questions, which will be relayed to me um, and then relayed to you, John. Um, so we'll just kind of get started right away. Um, obviously, this is an interesting and I think unprecedented time to be, you know, in in higher education. Um, there's not a lot of uh, known known um, plans for the coming semester. Uh, so I think the University of California schools, they've decided they're going all online um, for the coming semester, but then other universities across the country are sort of not committing one way or the other, thinking of, you know, maybe part online, part in-person learning. Um, so wanted to just start, you know, ask by asking you what you think uh, the plan is for Drexel at the moment and sort of how you're weighing those various uh, uh, sort of approaches for the for the fall. Thanks, David. Um, um, would you mind actually if I um, took one step back before that, because I think there's there's some important context that I want to lay out. It's it's really sort of on my mind. And so I don't I want to do justice to your question, but I want to I'll give you the way I'm thinking about this in, in context. And when, when Tom McGrath and I had talked about doing this um, a month ago, obviously things were different. And so I, I just wanted to offer some some of my thoughts to set this up and then, I, and then I'll definitely get to your question. So, I mean, obviously this is a time of incredible pain and sadness, which means to me, it's also a time for reflection. It's a time for action and it's a time for hope. And I, I just wanted to say a few things about that. I mean, it's a, it's a tragic and, and painful time for, our country, for Philadelphia, I know for Drexel and other universities as well. And it's especially difficult and painful for my African-American students and, and faculty and professional staff. And right now they are legitimately raising um, important questions about the na nature of racism and inequality on our campus. And, you know, I, I share that concern. I, I, I hear and feel the, the anger and the killing of George Floyd and 
other African Americans at the at the hands of police, and um, it's it's um, it's just everything I say in this interview is in the context of that, and I think it's it's offered us, though importantly, a time for reflection. Um, last Friday, we had a virtual town hall at the university. We had about 750 people uh, participate. You know, we discussed disparities on this campus. We talked about you know lack of support uh, at Drexel, um, and we talked about how do we create a community that's free of racism and, and discrimination where all members really feel valued and, and supported. And I think the um, the overwhelming sense out of that conversation is it is a time for reflection, but it's also a time for action. And I think this is I think this is the important thing I want to say to you in terms of setting up everything else is that, you know, whatever else happens to higher education from the COVID crisis, um, we must keep in front of us, um, you know, the mission of uh, of addressing racial inequalities at our university and at colleges and universities around the country um, and in our city. And you know, we need to do this in specific, you know, ways with specific investments and making sacrifices to do so. And while we'll talk today about the COVID context, I don't think there's any higher calling for Drexel or higher ed at this point than that. So we are dealing with, you know, um, a very complicated situation about re-entering campuses, but the context of this has changed and needs to stay in front of us. And I, you know, I, I'll end by saying I, I, I feel, I feel hope. I mean, tonight at six o'clock, we're going to graduate the class of 2020. We'll do it virtually as we're doing it right now. But a year ago, we were in Citizens Bank Park um, having that, having that celebration, um, and um, it was it was an amazing, it was an amazing event, and we won't be able to have all that pomp and circumstance. But I, I mean, I, I approach all of this now with a sense of hope because I know my 2020 graduates and all my other classes are going to go out there into a broken world, but you know, given their minds and their hearts, I feel like this generation hopefully can lead us forward because we've done a miserable job of it so far. So just to say that. Well, you know what? I mean, let's let's talk a little bit about the um, sort of, you know, the, these, you know, so questions of social justice and equity right now. I mean, we can, you know, I think, you know, it's obviously I wanted to discuss that with you a little bit. And I, I alluded to um, in my introduction of you, the sort of idea of the West Philadelphia initiative, um, you know, which was sort of a big investment and in changing of the neighborhood surrounding Penn. And I think depending on who you talk to that that initiative you know, was either a massive success or also a sort of massive instance of basically sparking gentrification. And I think according to one one report I'd read, found that between 2001 and 2011, the black population in that neighborhood decreased by more than half. Um, so I'm interested, you're sort of undergoing, you know, a similar type of broad scale development project in the area surrounding Drexel now. Um, and, and in some ways sort of similar in that there's a school component, right? Drexel has started a middle school that's going to be, you know, sort of a pillar of the community there, sort of like Penn Alexander and surrounding Penn was. So, you know, what, first of all, did you, have you taken any lessons from, you know, the, the Penn uh, initiative that you oversaw? And I mean, how are you, you know, are you thinking about ways to sort of avoid a similar type of, you know, demographic racial change in the neighborhood that you're now investing in? Yeah, I mean, we we could talk for a long time about the context of 1995 and and what we saw back then when we began the initiative. But I, I can tell you the genesis of the Penn Alexandra School was um, a, a significant call from members of the university community for a private laboratory school, which would have had tuition of ten or fifteen thousand dollars, whatever it would have been back then, kind of modeled on what they did at the University of Chicago. And it was our view that instead of doing something that right from the very beginning would be so incredibly exclusive, what we should do is reach out to the Philadelphia School District, which back then was experiencing a tremendous amount of, of, um, of problems in terms of their ability to do what they're, they're supposed to do. And we reached out and we said, why don't we collaborate on a sort of um, university assisted neighborhood school with a catchment area? Um, and make it open and free to all, and that's sort of that was the intent, which I think was a very, very good intent. And you know, and I can I, I can tell you that 
in my wildest dreams, I never would have imagined the way in which that neighborhood would have changed, I think in some positive ways, but also in some of the ways you pointed out. So yes, we take, we take that example to heart, both the good things and the bad things that happened in terms of, of, of the impact on the neighborhood in doing, in doing the work in, um, in, in Mantua and West Palton. And I, I can comment on that. We're actually building as we speak um, a, a K through eight school. It'll serve 800 children. Um, it's a combination of the old um, or the, the current Powell School, which is a K through four school, and then the middle school you refer to, which is a Science Leadership Academy middle school. We're building one home for those two schools right up at 36th and Filbert. The university raised for the benefit of this public school over $40 million. We've been doing it for nine years and it's under construction. You can actually go up there and see right now. And I, I think that what's 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 different about this is that we go in knowing the story of Penn Alexander and, and some of the downsides of that. And then from the very beginning, working with local communities to say, OK, how do we create uh, a school in the midst of a diverse and inclusive community and how do we keep it that way? And again, without going into a lot of details, we've been doing certain things in our neighborhoods relative to our residential population uh, of students and 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 other ways in which our expansion and growth is very much focused on areas where there are no people living right now. These are parking lots. These are open industrial areas that we've reclaimed to foster the growth and development the university needs to continue to have, but but to do it in a way that does doesn't shove people aside and that the school really is for the existing community, which we want to help invest in and nurture through uh, lots of different things that we're doing, including a you know, the, the, the promise, um, um, the promise neighborhoods grant where we support over 4000 students with a grant from the federal government. So the answer to the question is that that was an eye opening um, experience um, at Penn. And I think my team has taken all of that to heart and I've taken it personally in terms of trying to think about how do we, you know, how do we avoid some of the unintended consequences of that, but do something that's really important for this neighborhood, which is to give them access to high quality public education in a context where our university can sort of really lean into it and, and create opportunities for these kids, you know, to go forward and, and to, you know, have access to, to higher education, you know, private or public. I, I think another part of the sort of neighborhood equity conversation that you know, has often been discussed previously and has sort of been maybe thrown into even more relief now as a result of the COVID crisis and the budget crisis for the city government is, um, you know, this idea of pilots, which are payments in lieu of taxes. Um, so, you know, nonprofits that don't have to, like like Drexel or Penn, that don't pay property taxes, um, sometimes agree with the city government to, you know, pay a certain amount of money in lieu of those taxes. You know, that there's been a call, especially among Penn, uh, and the, I think is only one of two Ivy Leagues that doesn't pay pilots, um, you know, to, to do that. You know, now, like I mentioned, with the, the COVID crisis, there's sort of another sort of budgetary constraint in the city government. Um, so I'm interested if, if this has changed Drexel's own position about pilots and sort of how you think that might um, fit into a sort of, you know, uh, equitable, you know, uh, treatment of, of the city that you, you know, exist in. Well, let, let me let me sort of share my my sort of experience and then view of pilots. So I remember being at Penn when Ed Rendell was mayor and, and, and looking at the proposed pilot payment and thinking that if, if this is all we're going to do, we're we're getting off pretty easy that writing a check and saying, OK, now we can check the box and we've we've done our part seems to be inadequate. Um, against the true need in the neighborhoods as we understood it back then and obviously as we continue to invest going forward. And so look, right now Drexel, it, it, between all the various things that we do, I think we spend north of $40 million you know, sort of doing these types of payments. They may not be called pilots, but they're investments in community health centers and schools and our Liberty Scholars tuition you know, remission program, a whole bunch of things. The details are not important, but here's here's the thing. Um, I, I think that um, pilots can often be an excuse for an institution to do nothing more than write a check and then sort of move on. And I think that if you take a look at the effort that our university puts into our neighborhoods, it's many, many times more than I think whatever checks that we write. And I want to keep it that way. And so, you know, we're 
we're, we're very, very focused on what can we do from a civic engagement and investment standpoint um, to help all the surrounding neighborhoods, many of which are in even more pain, if it's even able to imagine even more pain than they've been in even in, in, in prior in prior times. And I, I think that it, it's too easy just to write a check and say you're done. I wouldn't want any sort of a pilot's proposal to dampen the the ardor and the need for these institutions to get engaged in significant ways. And so I worry that it becomes very transactional and that I write my pilot payment check and then I'm off the hook. I, I don't think so. I think, especially in America right now, universities really need to lean in um, to the issues in these neighborhoods. And I talked about my campus, and my campus is one part of that. But but the needs around the city are absolutely overwhelming. And we, we just bought half of St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in North Philadelphia. There's another tremendous set of needs um, in in that in that neighborhood in North Philadelphia around St. Chris and 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 the and the uh, children and, and the and the and the families that we serve, we're just getting our heads around what are we going to do there too. But we're approaching it not in a transactional way. We're, we're we're approaching it in a missional way. And so, pilots aside, a anything that makes it too simple is not good. And again, we invest. We're going to continue to invest. There's no issue about that. But. Honestly, I, I'd worry about things maybe going into the general fund and that not finding their way into the neighborhoods where the needs are so significant. In terms of bu budget questions, um, you know, we can sort of now maybe move a little bit to, you know, what, what's going on at Drexel. I mean, obviously, the coronavirus has not just impacted the city budget or city revenue, but I presume it's affected, you know, Drexel's revenue situation as well. Um, so. Maybe let's go back to my first question, which was sort of about, you know, how you're conceiving of the upcoming fall semester. Um, you know, I'm curious to know, you know, how how the how budget uh, is sort of factoring into your questions there, because, you know, if you presumably you have a lot of revenue coming from, you know, uh, the, the dormitory system, even that would sort of be shut off if you went to an all remote learning system. So just maybe talk about. Uh, how you're balancing, you know, these different priorities um, in terms of what you're thinking of for the for the coming semester. Sure. So um, the the hit we took um, from um, the the beginning of of the what is our sort of uh, spring term, which was March um, through the end of our fiscal year, which is June thirtieth, is about twenty six million dollars. So that was that that was the financial impact of having to sort of pivot. Uh, to leave the campus, um, to not charge, um, you know, room and board, which we didn't. That that alone was an eleven million dollar hit, and then just all the investments and dislocations associated with this. So, that's a twenty six million dollar problem, which we've solved for by expense reductions and deferring investments, especially in capital and, and things of that nature. As we approach this fiscal year, it's an even more significant number. Um, and you know, we're doing what any good institution would do. We're we're, we're sacrificing. We're you know, um, we're looking at um, non-personnel expenditures first because we're committed to making sure that we can keep everyone employed and 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 you know, not do any layoffs or any furloughs. We hope that will last. We have a plan for doing that. I'm not sure how much worse this is going to get before hopefully it gets better. Um, and then there are personal sacrifices. I'm taking a 20 percent reduction in my in my salary at least I can do I know my other officers are doing other types of reductions maybe a little bit less so everyone is sort of pulling in the institutional belt but I, I think the reason we want to come back in um, in September is um, that you know being out of this kind of community especially given the nature of a residential university, is very hard. I mean, I'm very proud of what my faculty and staff and students have done in terms of, of you know, the, the, the spring quarter, you know, and again, we're, we're, we're finished today and then the summer quarter, which is all enrolled. But, you know, you get to you get to the fall quarter and after a while, you, even though I think the online learning stuff and which we can talk about later on has been successful, you know, we we miss being in community and especially in light of, of some of the things I talked about initially 
you know, we need to be together to talk about those things and, and to do things together about that. So we're, we're trying to establish some sense of normalcy, but at the same time, you know, health and safety has to go first. So just yesterday, um, I, I put out an announcement to uh, the university community that we will resume in sort of a, a, a hybrid way on September 21st. Again, we're quarter systems, so summer is going to be online. Um, and, you know, courses will be offered. Some courses will be offered fully on campus. Some courses will be face to face, but with some remote um, uh, components, say large lectures, you know, can be online, but the, the, the breakouts can be in person. Some stuff we're going to do fully online. And mostly what we're going to do is, is a kind of a high flex approach where we ask each and every faculty member, OK, sort of reimagine what you're doing, what has to be in person, what can be online, what should be mixed together. And um, that's the shot we're going to give it. So we have thousands of courses that we offer. And so we're going to, you know, take a look at the ways in which we can, you know, sort of reorganize this. Uh, we're a research university, so essential research, including the production of PP&E, um, which has been going on um, um, all, all for the last several months, will continue and will ramp up slowly. And then when Governor Wolf gives us um, the green signal, whenever that is, we can more fully come back onto campus. But our bet is that September 21st, we'll resume the fall quarter. We'll go um, in this hybrid way through Thanksgiving, and then we'll send everyone home for Thanksgiving. The last week of the quarter will be online. Finals will be online. And so we'll be done by December 14th. That's our plan. And as you can imagine, for a university with 24,000 plus students and thousands and thousands of faculty and staff, pulling that off balancing health and safety with trying to come back into the community is it's super complicated and we're there's a thousand details that we have to work on between now and, and September 21st. I was just reading a, a Q&A article with a Stern, NYU Stern business school professor. Um, and he was es essentially making the argument that most colleges right now are being um, sort of willfully ignorant and thinking that they can charge full tuition for the, the sort of coming academic year and his rationale for this was basically twofold first that um, you know a huge part of the college experience is this in-person um, interaction which presumably will be sort of limited in some ways by necessity because of this, you know the chance of the virus still circulating with no vaccine um, and second that um, you know employers may eventually realize for a certain class of students to graduate that they were having online instruction which might depreciate the value of that degree during that sort of small time period. I'm just curious if what you think of that rationale and if you, you know, if you buy into the argument that uh, pandemic college is fundamentally different than regular college and therefore, you know, should be uh, as a good, you know, sort of priced differently. Yeah, I, I, I don't. And, and let me tell you why. So um, back in 1999, Drexel started something called Drexel e-learning, which was a big experiment in offering online degrees. And so um, in March, when we made our pivot, 5,500 of my students were already taking fully online degrees at that point, which, by the way, are under the same set of charges uh, for um, you know tuition that we have for our in-person students. So we've been doing this for 20 years. We've had really great outcomes. And, and I think people sometimes tend to sort of diminish online learning. The, the, the fact is students learn in all sorts of different ways. Many of our students really learn very, very well in online or hybrid settings. And you know others maybe do better in, in, in the classroom. But um, if, 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 you, if, you, if, if you look at the benefits of online learning, um, there's, um, there's you know beyond, I think, sort of really interesting pedagogy and sort of learning styles of certain students, there's a great deal of flexibility. Um, there is a great ability to sort of tailor um, these experiences. And, um, you know, we, we found consistent demand over those 20 years for online. So we, we've been working, you know, sort of almost, you know, platform agnostic for a number of years. You know, we do a lot in person. We do a lot in hybrid. We do a lot online. I have many students who are undergraduates here on campus who take online courses because they find that given the subject matter, they can learn just as well online. So, but then again, we've never done anything like we're about to start on September 21st. So I want to sort of evaluate the impact of this, this very sort of high flex system. But my, my sense is that it's going to be very rich and very complete. Uh, and we're going to find out 
that there's a ton of other issues that we need to work on to improve. But I think over time, as we're trying to figure out, you know, life in, in, in a COVID world um, as, a, as, a, as a university, uh, we're going to be able to deliver a very high quality education, you know, being as flexible as possible and, and engaging our students as much of all. And I think it's going to be a Drexel degree, uh, like, like the ones that, you know, were offered before all this happened. Have you seen an abnormally large number of deferrals from, you know, either incoming freshmen or students who are just saying, I'm going to take a pause for the next uh, couple terms? Yeah, we've we've seen um, we've seen a decline in our incoming freshman class. And, and that's been that's been a concern. Um, you know, I, I think and maybe we'll get to this later on in the conversation. You know, everyone has been focused on the big demographic, you know, um, decline to come you know, uh, because of, of the, uh, the the reduction in the number of, of high school graduates. So that's that's around 2026. So we were preparing ourselves to think about smaller class sizes anyway. This has come more precipitously. And so, you know, we're, um, we're disappointed. It's still going to be a large class. It's going to be 27, 2600 kids. So we feel very blessed that we have all these new kids coming, coming to our school. It's just not the 3000 or so that that we had before, which is disappointing. In answer to your question about sophomores and beyond, we haven't seen any change so far, uh, and we're very grateful for that. But it looks like the summer um, term is holding up, and um, we've done very well on retention in recent years. And I think people are really devoted to this place. And yes, they're upset by the dislocation, but um, one, one data point, which is I think important, you know, we're a co-op university, so we do these six months co-op. People work um, and, and get paid, and then they go back into the classroom. So you would expect at a time like this, the you know the placements in co-op would you know drop right through the you know the, the floor. Normally, we have about 98% of our students are on on, on co-op who choose to be on co-op in in, in 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 jobs where the average compensation is like seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars. It's 79% now. Now, obviously, I'd rather it be 98% than 79%, but 79% of those kids are working in virtual settings as we speak right now. And while that isn't, again, the same kind of experience that we would have wished for them at Pico or Comcast or Vanguard or some of the other big um, employers that we work with, that's still pretty good. So I think people see the value in what we're doing, even in a time of, of great dislocation. Let's zoom out a little bit and sort of talk about, you know, higher ed uh, more broadly, not sort of specific to Drexel, but, you know, there's in the past number of years, you know, the price of tuition sort of across the board has been rising. Um, you know, their students have large debt loads. And now with the, you know, economy sort of uh, probably going to be seeing a, a years long return to where we were prior to the, the pandemic, you know, I think you could imagine plenty of students who are sort of attending uh, fairly expensive private universities that are not like the Ivy League saying to themselves, what's, is it worth paying, you know, all of this money for a degree when I could maybe go to an in-state school for cheaper or, you know, try to get into one of these really high level elite universities. So this is a roundabout way of asking from your vantage point, I mean, what types of universities in the college ecosystem do you think are best um, suited to you know, survive in this in this moment? And I mean, are there certain types of schools that, you know, you think won't be able to weather this necessarily? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, so I, and this may this may sound contradictory, but I, I think COVID as bad as this is and as tragic as it is, has also provided universities with the kick in the pants that they need to really think about their model and what they do. And, and so, you know, for, for example, why aren't we offering more degrees, undergraduate degrees, say in three years? It's entirely possible. I mean, the, the academic calendar is an agrarian calendar, if you look at the history of it. So why, instead of, of spreading this out over, you know, that many years, aren't we thinking about school year round and then maybe infusing them with, with some sort of, you know, other types of experience, you know, co-op experiences. And so I, I think the institutions that are, that are sitting there right now in and saying hopefully this will pass and then we can go backwards to where we were the good old days are making a serious mistake i, I don't i don't think those days are going to reappear again um in part because of the demographics and i think in part uh because of the um of, of the tremendous 
public dissatisfaction with a lot of people that a lot of people have about about higher ed. We have not changed and evolved quickly enough, you know, you know, to meet to meet the needs. So, in answer to your question, uh, and maybe this is a little bit of self, a little bit self-serving, you know, I think the institutions that will do the best will be comprehensive, um, and 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 have a, 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 a very big portfolio of different types of programs that they'll match up with uh, the ability to do meaningful work during their time at the institution, you know, not just study the theory, but do the practice um, and get rewarded for that in terms of, of credentials. Uh, I think they'll be diverse because that's especially in this time in America, diversity is, is one of the most important things to experience. I think um, um, the institutions that really invest in in hybrid learning that are platform agnostic that can that can you know um, allow students to move freely from seminar rooms you know um, you know large-scale lecture halls that are, are done in a hybrid way to completely online and keep their educational journey going I think the institutions that are and, and here again I'm clearly biased in in urban settings um, I think location is very important and, and I think that place really counts and the ability to sort of convene in safe ways and and to and to build community um, is, is very important. So I, I, I think smaller, less diversified schools that only have sort of one core thing that they do um, are are going to be really threatened and, and particularly the ones that resist change that are saying, you know, look, we don't do online. We don't do this. We don't do that. We're very exclusive. I, I think that the, the watchword is inclusivity, not exclusivity. And so while there may be some institutions that can afford um, to turn lots of people away, I mean, I, I, I think that it's the institutions that are going to be more open and democratic and flexible are the ones that are going to, that are going to survive all this. You, you mentioned diversity there. I, one of the things I wanted to also talk with you about is um, there's a currently a case that is winding its way through the, the courts that I think a lot of observers think may end up before the Supreme Court, uh, which is a case uh, that would potentially bring about the end of affirmative action, um, claiming that you know that policy is um, sort of unequal to uh, discriminatory towards other groups, like, you know, sort of Asian students in particular are the folks who are bringing the suit, um, claiming that they're, you know, penalized and it's harder to get in um, if you're Asian. So I, I'm interested, to, especially, you know, considering the um, sort of among elite colleges, especially, you know, there's already sort of a degree of, you know, inequality, um, you know, both economic and racial. Um, and, and just to give one example, which I thought was sort of striking, I mean, this is for Penn, but, um, you know, according to the New York Times, 19% of Penn students come from the top 1% um, economically, and only 3.3% of Penn students come from the bottom 20%, um, which is kind of a striking stat to me. So I'm curious, you know, what would Drexel do? You know, let's say that this this suit in front of the Supreme Court was successful and, you know, sort of overturned affirmative action. I mean, what how would it go about sort of creating both an economically and, you know, racially diverse and inclusive um, student body is sort of in that in that uh, environment? Well, I mean, for speaking personally, I think it's a huge tragedy. And, and, and I say that because our degrees of freedom around affirmative action have been narrowed over the years. You know, we, we are at the point, I was looking at this before, where we, ha we can, ad we can ad adopt sort of very narrowly defined diversity admissions policies that consider race as, you know, one factor in a holistic approach. So it, th th our degrees of freedom have already been squozen pretty hard. So in, in, in thinking about that, I, I come back to maybe the topic we were talking about a little bit before, you know, what, what, what are we doing about the pipeline? What can we do to create a really strong pipeline of, you know, diverse students who are attached to Drexel somehow from the time they're little kids? And I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of a lot of what Drexel does, but the, the work in, in, in the Promise Zone and, and the Promise Neighborhoods grant where we have sort of stewardship over over 4,000, you know, school students. I know you interviewed Bill Height, um, you know, um, as, as, as part of, 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 of this um, series. And, you know, our alignment with the Philadelphia Public Schools around, you know, K through 12 education is very high. And as I said, we're building a school right now. So the way I think about this is, how how intentionally where no restrictions are placed on us 
by the Supreme Court or the federal government, how in a very intentional way to, can we create a cradle to career type of environment that we can help you know, anchor and, 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 and cultivate not only for the good of the neighborhoods, which is the first and foremost thing, but also as a, as a pipeline into our university. And, and, and how can we maybe among American higher ed institutions create a bit of a movement that says, look, if, if we're going to have further constraints put on us legally, we have a moral obligation as well as I think a, a, a practical one to think about how we create these pipelines and how we bring more and more kids who are in this great city uh, and give them the, you know, the, the benefit of a Drexel education. I, I've been doing this work for, for 10 years in this neighborhood. It's extremely hard, but right now we are in, in daycare centers all the way through eighth grade classrooms and then thinking beyond that. And that, that, is, a, that is a rich source of, of young people who one day hopefully will find their way into a Liberty Scholarship program and come to Drexel and be part of our community. Of our community. So I don't, I don't know how to game out what the Supreme Court's going to do. I, I would find it, as I said, tragic. At the same time, we then need to think about, okay, what, what other ways in which, which um, what other ways can we create access for these students? This next one is sort of uh, apropos of what we're talking about and is an audience question. Um, the, the question asks, uh, how does Drexel directly engage the surrounding community in determining what it is that community needs um, uh, rather than sort of just, you know, having Drexel say, here's what you need. Here is a bunch of money to fix things. So what specifically is Drexel doing to actually communicate um, and sort of strategize with that? Yeah. I, I, I thank that person for the question. I think, you know, um, you know, w w one of the things that universities, you know, tend to do is, look, we have a bunch of experts here. You know, we're gonna we're gonna think about the problem, and then we're gonna tell you the solution. And that's about the last way, especially now that you want to engage neighborhoods. So I, I think that we went back to um, um, something that's actually part of the history of American higher ed um, in the land grant universities called extension. And so extension, it, 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 you know, in the in the 1860s when it came about, was basically how do you how do you how do you get out of the ivory tower? How do you bring um, how do you bring the expertise of these land grant universities into the communities that support them? And it was all agricultural. You know, we just developed a new, you know, sort of seed, or we developed a new way of keeping insects away from your crops and things like that. And you had extension centers, and these centers were located in communities. And you know, the best of them collaborated on the needs of 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 the you know the farms and the universities to sort of kind of intersect and think about their problems together. You know, and so one of the things that we did about six years ago is we we um, we we created an extension center. It's in Mantua. It's at 35th and Spring Garden. You can go and see it. There's a free and open monthly dinner that we have with all of our neighbors. The average number of people before COVID was between two and three hundred, and that's just one small dimension. But you know, the, the the way of starting that is having a meal together and talking about you know what are my problems, what are your problems. Can we brainstorm on solutions? And I, I would submit that out of that extension center, a, a culture is being created. It's not perfect, but a culture is being created where, you know, neighbors and and members of the Drexel community are working together on commonly identified problems to solve them, solve together. them together. It is it is not a bunch of Drexel experts heading out there saying, look, you know, here's the solution. Tell me what your problem is because I can solve it. It's basically trying to be in community together. You know, we have a writer's room there where we had a poetry, you know, reading last night. We have these dinners. We have all these ways in which people can interact around the idea of, of, of problem solving. And, you know, we have a law clinic out there, which I'm very, very proud of. One of our colleagues, Rachel Lopez from the Klein School of Law runs that. And, you know, they're not out there to, to tell people what their legal problems they're a, a free law clinic to help solve those problems, tangle title and things like that. So I, I, I feel like this has been, um, we have we have absolutely learned more from the community than we've ever you know, been able to bring to them. It, it has been such an incredible um, experience, but to the, you know, to the, to the question, the idea of extension, where you don't come in with any preconceived notions, no one's doing research on the community. In fact, what it is is, constant gathering, identifying challenges, and then working in partnership to figure out how to deal with those challenges, strengthening, you know, um, the community university uh, um, relationships, and then going on to the next set of product problems. And that's that's what we're doing. That's sort of live in, in West Philadelphia right now.
Another audience question here, and if people have them, we're sort of running low on time, but send them in. Um, if you have any last ditch ones, we maybe have time for one or two more. Um, this question is about how Drexel uh, sort of related to online learning, um, how it's handling access to technology and Wi-Fi for their students um, who are doing online learning. And certainly this was a you know challenge for the school district of Philadelphia, who's many of whom uh, their students you know do not have good access to Wi-Fi, and I presume you have lots of international students who might be going back after Thanksgiving and have, you know, challenges there. So, uh, what's the university doing about that? Well, again, you know, I, I think one of the benefits that we have is the 20 years of experience in doing this. Um, so, when we had to make our pivot, it, it wasn't like, oh no, now what do we do? You know, we let's find, you know, let's find Zoom and learn how to do to do all this. I mean, we've been we've been doing this work in 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 sophisticated ways, both nationally and internationally for a long period of time. So we had a lot of internal capacity to at least understand what the challenges would be. And then right away, we set up a bunch of funds to be able to make sure that if people said, look, I, you know, I don't have good internet access, I don't have the right technology, I don't have the right equipment, we were able to get that in their hands relatively quickly. And, um, but I'm, 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 I think we responded in a way that I think has, has made this a completely fruitful academic experience. Everyone had what they needed to do their work. You know, you know, we had a couple of Zoom bombings. Things happened as they as they always do. But but I, I think for the most part, people had what they needed. They you know we we took an extra week of of, of break between uh, our winter and fall quarter instead of one. We had two weeks, and in those two weeks, our faculty really trained up. We really tried to figure out what our students needed, and we were able to close a lot of gaps pretty pretty quickly. And as we head into summer, I obviously feel a lot better because we have the spring quarter behind us, and I think we've identified what some of the weaknesses were. We've learned from them, and we're going to you know, address those. Uh, we have another audience question. Um, this is about what Drexel, if Drexel is going to be able to do robust testing and contact tracing um, and quarantine for the on-campus population um, in the coming terms. So, um, you know, one of the ways in which I think Drexel approaches um, our coming back to campus in, in the fall with a lot of strength is, you know, about about 40 percent of what we do at our university is around health sciences. You know, our School of Public Health, College of Nursing and Health Professions, College of Medicine, School of Biomedical Engineering, and all sorts of other people who think and worry about health policy and other other aspects like that. And so we have, you know, it, the, the Board of Health of the City of Philadelphia, seven members, three of them are Drexel faculty members. The head of this reentry task force uh, is Marla Gold, um, who is one of those one of those three. She's running the entire operation and, you know, she has a great deal of expertise um, and terrific um, relationships within the city. And so, you know, we have um, we've been making our own PP&E for the last number of months, distributing it mostly to hospitals and clinics. So we have internal capacity for um, for production um, and Marla and her team who have been working tirelessly over the last several weeks um, have, I think, developed a, 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 a sort of well thought out protocol for for uh, um, testing, tracing. We've also had to do some quarantine uh, because we had a couple of of, of, um, of people who were sick in, in the previous quarter. So we're able to do that on campus. So, you know, we've gained some experience, but here I think, and this is why it's good to be a university uh, like ours with this problem, is that we have a ton of experts around here who are not gonna let us do anything stupid or wrong. And I will always defer to them in terms of making sure that whatever it is, health and safety is first, we have the experts. They have the networks. Um, hopefully, we'll have the resources, and and you know we're committed, or else we won't, you know we won't go and go as aggressively as we are. But I feel very confident that on, on those issues we have we have the right team in place. Great. Well, we're almost out of time here. I'm going to try to squeeze in just one last audience question. Um, thanks to all of those uh, questions and people who submitted them. Um, this last question, uh, putting you on the spot a little bit, it says. You spoke earlier about action steps and reflection regarding equity. What are three steps you are taking right now at Drexel to eliminate the systemic racism found in higher education? Yep. So, um, 
I'm not going to dodge that question. I, I actually have three things. They're very well worked out at this point because I've been um, obsessing about them since our town hall last week. So I, I'm not going to get ahead of my university community and tell you what those three things are. But I think the spirit of the question is very important. So what I heard last week and what I've been hearing consistently is, look, you know, the, the rhetoric it is always there and the action never follows. And people are, are tired of empty promises and platitudes and and you know never never sort of delivering. So we've identified based on um, the town hall three very, very specific actions which we will roll out in a in a university communication probably tomorrow and you can read about them there. I just I don't want to share it with this audience before I share it with my community. But uh, the spirit of the question is exactly right. Actions now speak louder than words, and you know people are tired of the words. They want to know what the actions are, and we are going to do that, and we are going to do that in in concert with our community. I will tell you one thing that I'm thinking of, which would be in 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 that list, and probably uh, a little bit beyond. I I, I think the dislocation in uh, West Philadelphia. Uh, minority-owned businesses, West Philadelphia-based uh, businesses, I think you could probably see this on Baltimore Avenue where you live, has been profound. That will be one of the areas where we make big investments with technical expertise, entrepreneurship training, and and all sorts of other things. That, that will definitely be one of them. Great. Well, thanks for your time, John. Um, and again, thanks to all of the audience uh, members who posed questions. Uh, it was good to speak with you and I uh, wish we could have done this in person, but, you know, Hopefully this was not a bad substitute, um, not unlike online learning, I guess. So, and, and David, thanks for your thanks for your good questions. I I, I appreciate um, what Philly Mag is doing to bring us all together. It's a it's a really difficult time, and it's really important that we, you know, take the spirits of the the spirit of this con these conversations and and then, like we said, put them in action. So thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone.